Hello, my name is Fran Sands. Uh, welcome to myboxingcoach.com. Okay, um, I wanted to talk to you about the subject of white collar boxing, a phenomenon that has become increasingly popular in recent years. Um, it's quite a wide ranging subject, and it you know it brings out some. Uh, let's just say people in, in, in other forms of boxing have so maybe mixed feelings about it. So I just wanted to um, talk you through what I view as, as what white-collar boxing is, where it fits into the world of boxing. I want to look at the positives, the risks, and um, taking care of yourself when it comes to white-collar boxing. And I'll also talk to you about how I would coach a white-collar boxer. Right, so where does white collar boxing fit in? Look, it started a number of years ago, I believe it started in New York, where the, the, the name white collar boxing came from the fact that some um, office workers, Wall Street traders, I think it might have been, kind of got together and for whatever reason uh, decided to don the gloves, get in the ring and, and try their hand at boxing. In recent years it's become, it's really grown and it's gone into two specific types of areas which we'll get into that's moving into a world of where we've conventionally had two types of boxing you had professional boxing and we had amateur boxing or olympic style boxing the thing to recognize <coughs> excuse me the thing to recognize about these two exi existing forms of boxing is that they are both heavily regulated they've been around for a long time They've witnessed their share of uh, difficulties, tragedies, and we've developed a situation where both are heavily regulated in the interests of safety. Um, so with pro boxing, you will either have national or in the US state levelled uh, um, athletic commissions, or in, here in the UK we have the British Boxing Board of, the con of Control, they are centralising regulatory bodies. Each boxer must register with those bodies, must undertake initial medicals, including brain scans and ongoing medicals throughout uh, their career. And those bodies set in place the regulations about how the boxer should train and in respect of um, making weight and... and, and medical sort of oversight and all of those things quality of coaching so as a as a, as a coach in pro boxing you have to pass um tests certainly here in the uk you have to pass a british boxing board of control test so amateur boxing olympic style boxing is the same it, it, it has a centralized governing body called aiba the amateur international boxing association um each country then is affiliated with AIBA and each country's um, governing body um, adopts and applies the AIBA safety, technical and competition rules. Um, so for someone like me, if I'm coaching under AIBA rules, um, I, there's a lot of responsibility put on me, so I have to pass coaching qualifications. Every three years I have to undertake a, a first aid um, course, a safeguarding course, how to, how to create a safe environment in here, both physically and emotionally and psychologically. Um, so there's a huge onus on, if you can see, from in both of the existing codes, lots of regulation, all geared towards safety and providing a... Uh, an environment and a, and a culture of safety. So what about white collar then? Well, there's two broad types of white collar. Um, so let's take the first one, which is uh, sometimes referred to as semi-pro boxing. And what this is, is a promoted version of boxing where a collection of individuals, those individuals usually have some background in boxing or one of the martial arts. Um, they may have done multiple of the other type of white collar. They may have had some professional experience or some amateur experience. But let's, let's call this what it is. It's, it's, it's unlicensed boxing being promoted to make money. 
the boxers make some money, the promoter makes some money, that's it. But it is unlicensed boxing. The the trainers are not regulated. They can be any anyone off the street on fight night. There may be some medical of um, medical um, um, skills available in terms of making the fights. What you know, as a interestingly, as a, as an amateur boxing coach or as a coach who coaches amateurs, I have much of a, as much of a responsibility to the. Uh, to the to the boxer in the other corner. So we, when we make matches, we are very honest. We don't try and get a little bit of a um, pull the wool over our our fellow matchmakers' eyes. We come clean about the history of our boxer and, and what kind of backgrounds have they had any history in kickboxing, for example, which is which is a key consideration in semi-pro sort of white collar fights. That none of that matters. Okay, you you've been in and around the game long enough, you know what you're getting yourself into. So then there's this second type of white collar boxing, which is the charity version, and this is where lots of money gets raised for charity. Um, they are promoted events. Great. Okay, money money is being raised. That's a that's a real positive. And it's a challenge for the individuals involved. You know, a ten or twelve week training program at the end of which you get to step up in the ring and test yourself. So big positives there as well. Money being raised, big positives around personal challenge. However, remember, this is boxing. Um, care must be taken. Look, that's something I always say about this stuff I, I do online. If I'm a tennis coach and I give bad advice online, then, um, you know, you're... you're your forehand may suffer. Your serve and volley game may suffer. If I'm a uh, football, uh, if I'm a golf coach, then your handicap may suffer if I give you crap advice. If you if you're a boxer or involved in boxing and I give you crap advice, then you can potentially get hurt. Boxing is is a sport that is tough and unforgiving at the best of times. So care must be taken. The interesting thing with white collar is there is no single regulatory body covering it. That means that anyone can be a coach, anyone can be a trainer, um, anyone can promote them. No control. There is no control over how much weight one individual gives to another. There is no control over whether an individual has had ten previous fights as as a as an amateur boxer and they're stepping in against someone who's an absolute raw novice. It's, it's a dangerous game. Let me tell you a very quick story. Bad things do happen. I was involved with someone online a, a good number of years ago, and he sparred with his so-called trainer, who fractured three of his ribs. I, I've never known ribs be, be fractured in this ring, broken ribs. It's not something that happens a lot. That's probably because um, what we don't allow is a brand new novice off the street to get in the ring with someone who's quite seasoned and allow that seasoned person to unleash body shots that are, are, are such, so, so, so damaging. Breaking ribs is not easy, even in someone who's not conditioned to take shots. They're not, it's not easy to do, but it certainly happened, and that can happen elsewhere. I've heard of numerous similar events. So look, advice from me. <sighs> look, I often hear this, oh, it's white collar. No, but listen, we're putting head guards on them, we're wearing big gloves. So what? It's got nothing. Gloves, big gloves and head guards have got nothing to do with safety. Safety is about culture and accountability of the, of, of the individual controlling the gym environment. I could run a spa in that ring with both boxers wearing 10-ounce gloves and I could run a safe, controlled spa. Okay. It's taken me a lot of years to be able to do that, but I could do that um, because you control both of the individuals. So the ideal situation is that you have a single coach in charge of all of the competing boxers who are going to box on the night. 
you don't have rival camps, if you like. You don't have um, coaches who are not visible as to what the what the others are doing because these are brand new raw novices. And I mean an actual coach. I don't mean a boxer or an ex-boxer. This is another thing that people talk about. Oh, he's a boxer or he's had some boxing fights. He must know what he's on about. It took me two years to stop being a boxer and start being a coach. That transition was really tough. Um, the two things are, are worlds apart. Of course a boxer can give some advice, but it doesn't make them a coach. Being a boxer does not make you a coach. Let's get that absolutely clear and straight. Um, so what do you need to be seeing? You need to be seeing regular weight checks. Regular checks of your weight throughout the, the training programme. You need to see structure in your training so you need to have a clear picture of what you're going to be doing for that 10 or 12 week period all of these are positive signs if you feel that the coach is being over cautious good um, that's fine uh, much better that than the other way and you may not know who you're going to be fighting up until the last moment again that's a good sign because that's leaving the coach and, and the people who are running the thing to look at all of the boxes and go, well, Steve and David, them two look about, are about the same. You know, the weight is good and, and they're both about the same level in terms of skills. It allows them to create a competitive evening, but, you know, um, make sure that people are not out of their depth. One of the key things, if you are early days, so if you're in the first... Um, few couple of weeks of your training regime and you're getting in the ring and you're sparring and you are getting bingo you're taking big headshots and you're you know although all those of us who've, who've boxed know that feeling of everything going white bang seeing stars and all of that if you're encountering that in the first week or two of your training it, that's no reason that that should be happening so walk away is my simple advice walk away if that's happening, if you're getting in a ring and you're, you know, fearing for your life because some guy in front of you is hitting you hard and the coach is simply not intervening and not controlling that spa, walk away because it's only going to get worse from there. Yeah. Don't worry about the fact that, oh, you know, forget ego. Ego's got nothing to do with this. Um, this is about personal safety. Ego's for the birds. Forget about that. Um, so how would I coach a white collar boxer? Oh, well, think of it this way. It takes me six to 12 months, there or thereabouts, to coach a boxer from knowing nothing to being in a position to get in a ring to um, execute the majority of skills of boxing to a competent level and to be able to implement some simple tactics and a game plan and for me to be able to give them effective instruction so there's about 40 individual skills I, that I believe boxing can be broken down into that's not including some of the sort of um, subtle tactical stuff and, and, and a few of the fancy uh, foot moves and stuff so 40 skills it takes me 6 to 12 months to get those 40 skills to a reasonable level so in 12 weeks, I reckon I could probably coach a boxer about 10 of those skills to a reasonable and good level. Um, what would those skills be? Stance, movements in and out, side steps, diagonal movements, the jab, straight, the backhand, straight, um, duck, the layback, double arm block and backhand block. That's 10 skills I'd go with. No hooks, no uppercuts. Too complicated, no chance of teaching someone those shots in a 12-week period. I just don't see that as being realistic, as well as everything else. So I would, they would be my chosen skills, and I would drill those into that individual so that by the time you got into the ring... And listen, about the hooks and uppercuts, if a boxer who's, who's been taught those 10 skills well and another boxer who someone else has then tried to teach them uppercuts and hooks in, the, in that same 12-week period, 
And I was told this beforehand, my money, if I was a better man, would be on the guy who'd been taught 10 skills and only two shots. Those two shots can be to the head or to the body. So you've actually got four striking opportunities. That would be my logic. The physical bit's fairly straightforward. Build some core fitness, develop that over time, conditioning. The physical bit is neither here nor there. What matters is the skills that get taught. Um, something I have... My, a concept of my online students who, who work with me on my various training programs. They have this concept of kettle time boxing. I'm an Englishman, so I drink tea until it's coming out my ears. So when the kettle's boiling, I get in my stance and I move back and forward, left and right, jabs, backhand. Anyone I worked with for a 12-week period on a white-collar um, project, I was encouraged to do that every spare moment. You don't need to be in the, th the throes of a session. Every spare moment. Okay, that's that's me. Um, hope you've enjoyed this. Sign up to the Beginner Boxer Toolkit. Uh, seven tools and techniques to help guide your journey on, in boxing. Lots of stuff in there. Really, really helpful in respect of structured training and, and fitness. Meanwhile, my name's Franz Sands. Please leave a comment, subscribe, share, all of that stuff. My name's Franz Sands and this is uh, mybuxingcoach.com.